Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second wellness program for the 2012-2013. Um, I'm Laura Scott. I'm with Cadillac Healthy Ages. Glad to see another full house. And because we've been so popular, we are now taping our programs. And they will be shown, um, hopefully, um, Monday nights after Community Health Journal. So Community Health Journal's at 8 o'clock. And then afterwards at 8.30, the program will be shown. So if somebody says, I couldn't get in, I was turned away, at least we have an opportunity that maybe the rest of our community can see some of the education that our physicians are so willing to give us. Just a couple of announcements. Over on the wall over here where the coffee is, there is a handout for our next end of life issue issues. That's going to be November 6th at the Hampton Inn. It's one of our more popular programs. We run it four times a year, and it's always a sellout. About 40 people um, attend each time. So if you have not attended and would like to, just call according to that, what's on the flyer. Also, reducing risk for type 2 diabetes, and information there regarding the program that's available through Cadillac Diabetes Learning Center. Um, also, the chaplaincy is offering some interesting um, educational programs, and if you are interested in um, the art of life, dilemmas, decisions, celebrations, there's a handout there. And also from our um, Neurological Resource Center, the new transmitter. If you don't get it in the mail, there's extra copies here on the table. I am extremely pleased um, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Shannon Bales. She's new to the Tri-City area and is um, ready to speak to you again. Dr. Bales. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Laura. Hi there, folks. It's nice to see you all here today on this lovely fall afternoon. Um, some of the Halloween decorations were starting to go up in my neighborhood, so it sort of inspired some of the pictures you'll see uh, on, this, on this talk. Um, yes, indeed, it's time to get the skeletons out of the closet and talk about osteoporosis, a condition very near and dear to my heart. Um, probably a lot of you know someone who's been affected by osteoporosis if you haven't been affected yourself. So I'm going to do a, what's a sort of a general overview, talk about what is osteoporosis, move into what are the risk factors, how would it be diagnosed, um, and then treatment and some possible side effects of treatment. Um, I do want to make it very clear from the start that this is clearly not intended to be sort of general medical advice for everyone. Um, certainly before you would follow any recommendations um, in this talk, I would uh, request that you speak with your personal physicians. Um, for example, starting an exercise program. Some, uh, some physicians may feel that for individuals in this audience that may not be a good idea. So uh, please keep that in mind. Um, and I'm just going to grab my advance here. Um, and without further ado, let's discuss osteoporosis. So what is osteoporosis? So essentially, it's a condition in which the bones are weak. They're thin. And they can break easily. Here is a picture of what normal bone looks like and what osteoporotic bone looks like. Now, the way that I always sort of think of this is, if, imagine if you had chicken wire or rebar or something, and you threw some cement at it or some cookie dough, kind of. That's what your bones kind of look like. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but there's calcium is the cement or the cookie dough, and the rebar or the chicken wire, that is a different part of your bones. And you're sort of left with just the bare chicken wire if you have osteoporosis. Now the bigger question is, well, why do we care if someone loses all of the cement in their bones? Well, a lot of reasons, but perhaps the number one reason is broken bones are a problem. Not just because they hurt, but because they are associated with other very bad things. This is one absolutely terrifying statistic. Approximately 25% or more of patients who are older than 50, if you break a hip, you have a quite a high likelihood of dying within one year. 
Um, another reason that we care, particularly with the elections coming up in the near future, um, there are a lot of people that have diabetes, 10 million, and there are three times that the number of people who are at risk, meaning they have osteoporosis. You can see some of these here. Vertebral fractures, the, the bones in your spine are the most common, followed by wrist fractures when you fall and catch yourself, followed by hip fractures and other fractures. Now, when people have fractures, it costs a lot of money to society in general. I know it's a very big issue coming up with the elections. Um, and certainly it is a large amount of the budget for um, various medical insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid. So we're spending a lot of money as a society on the subsequent results of osteopor osteoporosis, whether it's treated or untreated, fractures themselves are very expensive. Um, additionally, I just wanted you to see this number right here. $25 billion is what we think it's going to cost society in 2025. Now, I said that I would go ahead and talk about bones a little bit more. Um, I already sort of gave you the chicken wire, cement idea. Collagen is the framework. That is the chicken wire or the rebar. And the calcium phosphate is the cement. It, that's what sticks to the rebar and gives the bones its strength. Now the calcium is in the calcium phosphate, the cement-like material. And it stores more than 99% of your body's calcium. Less than 1% of your entire body's calcium is actually floating around in your blood. So this is really where the bulk of the calcium is. If you lose that calcium for various reasons over the course of your life, um, then you start to have weak bones. So in the ideal world, you would be, your body makes bone as fast as it resorbs bone. Um, the removing bone is very important because it gets rid of old bone. Old, weak bone replaces it with new, strong bone. And that is a process that continues throughout the course of your life. However, in the early stages of life, more bone is made than is removed. And actually, the peak of your bone mass, um, it sort of depends on everyone and whether you're a male or a female. But around the age of 30 is when your bones are their strongest. And after, and after that time, particularly after menopause in women, and um, as men um, become more elderly, um, the process switches and more bone is removed than is formed. It has to do with some hormonal balances as well as nutrition and activity and a whole, whole range of, of reasons for that. So that is essentially how, some, how someone would end up having osteoporosis and why it is such a common thing to occur as we get older. Now I do want to take a little bit of time and just talk about these charts. Um, if you look at the top here, down here is age, 20s to 80s. And this talks about how dense your bones are. So you can see for various ethnicities, the bone density declines with age. If we move down here to the bottom charts, you can see that bone mass, what the bottom part is showing us is that fracture risk is indeed associated with decreased bone mass. So as the bone mass gets weaker, fracture risk goes up. The other thing that this chart is showing you is that a bone density of, say, here, 0.7 in someone who is 50 is very different than a bone density of 0.7 in somebody who is 80. This gets at the other sort of missing piece of osteoporosis management. There's bone quantity, which is bone density. 
which we have, which you've touched on. But then there's also this idea of bone quality. And that's a little harder to quantify. We don't have any tests for that. It's somewhat genetic. Um, but certainly the quality of bone also decreases with age, as well as the quantity of bone decreasing with age. So how do you know if you have it? Are there any symptoms? Unfortunately, not really. Um, it is considered sort of a silent disease. Some people will have broken bones in their spine that may lead to back pain, and that may be one of the first symptoms of having osteoporosis, is a broken bone in the back. Another thing that might happen is you can see this, this change in posture. We call that kyphosis. And Having kyphosis would make me as a physician think that possibly your risk for osteoporosis is higher if you have a posture that sort of looks like this, a little, little more bent over, a little bit of a, a little bit more of a bump at the top. The other thing that as a physician I know how to try to guess who might have osteoporosis is simply by known risk factors. Now what I mean by that is um, some very smart people have done epidemiologic studies looking at who has osteoporosis and what their characteristics are, kind of gone backwards to try and figure that out. Now here are some of the risk factors that we know about that you can't change your gender, your, your sex, whether you're male or female, females are at higher risk. And in general, you can't really change that. Um, <laughs> additionally, your age. I know we would all like to believe that some of those creams that we buy at, at the drugstore helps reverse that, uh, but in general, we tend to consider that as something that can't be changed either. Um, body size, um, petite, Women, in particular, are the people that stand out in our minds as, uh, in general, people who have the highest potential risk of osteoporosis. Um, ethnicity as well. I think you saw in the charts I just showed that certainly um, African American, um, black ethnicity, um, followed by um, Hispanic, followed by non-Hispanic whites, tend to have um, different risks of osteoporosis simply based on ethnicity. Um, additionally, family history. That kind of gets at the bone quality issue that I was speaking of. If your parents had broken bones, you're certainly known to be at higher risk simply because of your heritage and your parents. And then other underlying diseases. If you have certain diseases, as a physician, I would consider that potentially you have a higher risk for osteoporosis if you have any of the following, <laughs> a long list. And sometimes it's simply because of the disease itself, the disease process itself. And sometimes it's related to the treatments for various disease processes. For example, the first one up there, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, um, people are typically on steroids throughout their life or on and off throughout their lives and we know that that is one medication that can really make your bones thin. All steroids can do that um, to sort of varying degrees depending on how long you took it, how strong the steroid is. Um, now multiple myeloma is a condition that affects the bones directly and can cause osteoporosis simply by making the bones weak from the disease process itself, not necessarily the medications. Um, as you can see, there are a long list here. Um, certainly at the end, if anyone would like me to speak more about any of these conditions and how they relate to osteoporosis, I would be happy to. Um, but let's move on ahead to the modifiable risk factors, meaning the things that we know contribute to osteoporosis and can increase your risk, but you might be able to do something about it. And I think that this is perhaps the most, the more fundamental point of what I want to get at in this talk. This is how you can potentially decrease your risk for osteoporosis. 
Now some of these risk factors include sex hormones, that's both in men and women. That's why women after menopause have higher risk of osteoporosis. The sex hormones in general are decreased. Um, there is a growing recognition of, um, of a decrease in males as well with their sex hormones. Low testosterone, testosterone deficiency certainly will contribute to osteoporosis in men. Um, I think probably everyone knows about the second one, perhaps, the calcium and vitamin D intake. Keeping a good level of calcium in your diet or through supplements as well as vitamin D supplements or sunlight or food is important to trying to help decrease your risk of osteoporosis. Um, lifestyle in general encompasses a lot of different things. Um, exercise, tobacco use, alcohol use, and then again, certain medications. Um, I touched on this a little bit already, but some of the medications that if you've been on for any extended period of time, um, I would consider your risk to potentially be higher to have osteoporosis. Those include steroids, we touched on that already, but as well, Dilantin for seizures and other um, conditions, Lupron, um, Here's another big one, antacids. Um, not just any antacids, in fact, calcium is actually, is, Tums is actually made out of calcium. So that's maybe, that one doesn't really count, but proton pump inhibitors, which is a um, pretty big class of anti-reflux medication, including Prilosec, Protonix, Nexium, you may know it as Omeprazole, something like that. Those actually can make the bones weaker as well. Um, cancer treatments in general uh, tend to make the bones weaker, um, and then excessive thyroid hormone. Being an endocrinologist, I see that one quite a lot. Um, thyroid hormone requirements will change over the course of your life. So if you're on thyroid hormone replacement and you haven't had your thyroid levels checked in 10 years, I would recommend it for any number of reasons, but pertinent to this talk, if you're on too much thyroid hormone, it could certainly make your bones weaker. So, based on some of those risk factors and others, what, who should be screened? Well, right now the recommendations are that any woman over the age of 65 should be screened. Now, if, um, if the woman underwent early menopause or perhaps surgical menopause where the ovaries were, were removed at the age of 30 for some reason, well then perhaps she should actually be screened earlier. Okay, these are not hard and fast rules, but these sort of are the rules that most insurances will pay for. Um, any man over the age of 70, this is a little, um, osteoporosis in men is a growing field. I can spend some more time at the end talking about that as well if anyone's interested. Um, this recommendation of any man over 70 is coming from a few of the various academic guideline organizations, but it's not seriously, a, it's, it's not particularly a widely accepted criteria at the moment. Um, and then anyone with red flags. And what I mean by red flags is anyone who has some of those risk factors that I was just talking about. Um, I borrowed this uh, next slide, I believe, from the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Um, you can sort of take it home with you, make some little checks, think about how it might apply to you. Um, but certainly, um, this, is, this is sort of a little quiz that you can take to see what your risk for osteoporosis might be. So if any of you are sitting in the audience thinking, hey, I have some of those things you just talked about. I'm on some of those medications, or my mother broke a hip, or I don't think I get out in the sun very much. Um, how might we determine whether you actually have a low bone density. Well, the way we typically make the diagnosis is through something called dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful. We all call it a DEXA. Probably a lot of you have had DEXA scans in the past. They're also called bone density scans. If you haven't had one, they are a radiology study. Um, kind of like an x-ray, kind of like a CT scan, but not really any of those things. You kind of lie down into a machine that's not enclosed, if anyone has any trouble with claustrophobia, um, and you just relax for a little while. And then after you're done, they tell you what your bone density is. Um, 
The bone density test will typically measure at the hip, maybe both hips, maybe just one. If you have a hip replacement already, then we certainly can't use that side to tell us if you have osteoporosis. Um, we might want to look at the other side. We usually will also look at the lumbar spine, which is the low part of the back. Um, and sometimes we'll even do the forearm if, you, if, um, if the person ordering the bone density scan is concerned that perhaps your bones are weak for specific reasons. Um, we take these, we take all of these different pictures together, we take all this information together, and, um, and we, we essentially take the worst of the three spots. And depending on which spot is worse, then we give you a diagnosis of osteopenia, osteoporosis, or normal bone density. Now, <clears throat> when I get a DEXA scan, I look at all kinds of things. I look at the actual pictures to make sure that the study was done adequately and appropriately. Um, and I look at a whole other, a whole host of things go into interpreting these bone density scans. But in the very end, we end up with what's called a T-score. And I have no idea why it's called a T-score, but that's what we call it. And if, you are, if your T-score is less than negative one, you're considered to have osteopenia, which is weak-ish bones, somewhere in between. Not quite osteoporosis, but weak-ish bones, meaning that you are at higher risk of progressing to osteoporosis in the, in the future, and you're also at a higher risk of having a fracture than someone with normal bone density. But you're not quite at as high a risk for fracture as someone that has true osteoporosis. So then we move to a T-score of less than negative 2.5. And that is enough to give you the diagnosis of osteoporosis. If you have a T-score of negative 2.5 or more negative, negative 3, negative 3.5, negative 4, you're officially diagnosed with osteoporosis. There's another way to be diagnosed with osteoporosis. If you have osteopenia and you've had a fracture already, um, and I don't necessarily mean in a high intensity car accident, but if you slipped getting out of the bathtub and you have a broken arm and you have a bone density scan that says you have osteopenia, then because you have that fracture as well, we go ahead and move you into the category of osteoporosis. This other chart that I'm showing down at the bottom here is, um, is essentially very similar to some of the ones that I've shown before, but 10-year probability of fracture in someone who is 80 with a T-score of negative 0.4, you have about a 50% chance of a very severe fracture if your T-score is negative 4 and you're 80 years old. If you're 50 and you have a T-score of negative 4, you have a 20% chance, which is still very high in 10 years to have a very severe fracture. Um, but as we head over here, to normal bone density, which would be anything from negative one above, you can see that the risk for, the risk for having a severe fracture in 10 years is less than 10%. So certainly all of these measures have been validated in large scale clinical trials. So we already mentioned some of the modifiable risk factors of osteoporosis. That Lead, those known modifiable risk factors lead into how can we prevent osteoporosis. And it, it gets at what some of those modifiable risk factors were. Calcium intake, vitamin D intake, exercise, decreasing or stopping altogether tobacco and alcohol, carbonated beverages as well, interestingly enough, can make your bones a little bit weaker, and salt through a variety of mechanisms um, that have mostly to do with the kidneys, um, high salt will also bring the calcium out of your bones, thus making them weaker. These, uh, the recommendations for prevention of osteoporosis are the same for men and women, but I'd really like to say again, you need to check with your personal physician to see whether or not they would recommend these kind of things for you. Um, if you have kidney stones, you may or may not want to be doing the calcium and the vitamin D. If you already have back pains and 
and maybe compression fractures already, um, the type of exercise that you would want to do would be very different than, say, a you know, 20-year-old volleyball player. So um, please speak with your personal physician before undergoing any of these recommendations for prevention. Um, I, I thought that it might be useful to just include a table here. Um, you can get calcium from a lot of things, um, certainly calcium supplements, um, but also from all kinds of food that you might be surprised at. Um, orange juice often has calcium added to it. Um, salmon has calcium. Of course, all the dairy products have calcium. Um, but the green veggies, the turnip greens and the broccoli, those all have calcium as well. So if you don't want to take calcium supplements, you can certainly you know, start reading the labels on the back of your food. And you might be surprised at what things actually have calcium in them. And what and what doesn't? Another very important piece of the puzzle when we're talking about osteoporosis, not just the prevention of osteoporosis to prevent fractures, but the prevention of falls to prevent fractures. Hopefully, someone has discussed with everyone in here um, some of these some of these issues, but um, just to go through them, poor vision, poor hearing, poor night vision um, is something that can potentially, or dizziness, weakness, these are things that could potentially be addressed through physical therapy, changing um, pres glasses prescription, and it's been shown time and time again that simply addressing these kind of problems can really decrease your risk for falls. Um, rubber soled shoes um, as opposed to ones that are slippery on the bottom, um, trying to keep area rugs and clutter and animals running around potentially to a minimum. Um, there have been all kinds of falls and fractures from area rugs and, and you know, animals running around. Um, if you do feel like you're a little weak or your balance is a little off, I would speak to your personal physician about potentially getting an evaluation by physical therapy or occupational therapy. They can um, potentially help give you exercises, exercises to strengthen things, exercises to help you with your balance, and potentially recommending a cane or a walk or, or something to just give you a little extra steadiness. Um, please remember to hold the handrails uh, on the stairs and keeping a flashlight near the bed in case the light goes out and you need to get to something so that you're not tripping on things when the power goes out. Um, okay, so once you have established that you have a diagnosis of osteoporosis or osteopenia, what kind of things would we recommend as treatment? Well, before we move into the medications, yes, the diet and exercise would be recommended for essentially everyone. The vitamin D, the calcium, and the proper exercise. Exercise that is weight-bearing tends to be um, the best. So unfortunately, swimming, while it is an excellent cardiovascular exercise, will help with all kinds of um, cardiovascular disease and cholesterol and diabetes, it's not the greatest treat, um, in the treatment of osteoporosis. It really needs to be things like walking meaning your bones are carrying the, the load of your body. Weightlifting has also been shown to be an ex, you know, with very light weights, repetitive has been shown to be very useful in the, uh, in the treatment and prevention of osteoporosis as well. Um, now, <clears throat> I just wanna say not everybody with osteopenia really qualifies for treatment of osteoporosis with medications. Uh, this is a, an area that is under hot research. Um, the guidelines on this seem to be changing all the time. So if I were to give this next year, who knows, I might come up to you and say, gosh, well now we're saying everybody with osteopenia should get treated the same as everyone with osteoporosis. But at this point, um, it's a bit of a middle ground. The physician um, along, of course, with the patient, kind of makes the decision about whether treatment is appropriate or not based on risk factors, based on personal history, based on family history. There's even a calculator <clears throat> online um, called FRAX, F-R-A-X. If anyone's interested, you can certainly Google it, plug yourself in. It takes into um, account score, you know, T-scores and, 
um, and all kinds of historical things to try and help make a determination as to whether someone with osteopenia needs pharmacologic treatment for their, for their disease. If you have full-blown osteoporosis, meaning you've either had a recent fracture and you have osteopenia, or you have a T-score of less than negative 2.5, we probably would recommend treatment with some kind of pill. Now, what pill or infusion or injection that we would recommend um, certainly depends on many other things, including your age, your other health problems, how severe the osteoporosis is. Whether you prefer to have shots or pills once a year, once a day, once a month, there's all kinds of choices of, um, di of, sorry, diabetes, of osteoporosis medications. Our typical choice of medication for osteoporosis in the typical person that doesn't have incredibly severe osteoporosis or doesn't have incredibly severe other medical conditions would probably be a pill. Um, in the category of a bisphosphonate. Um, if you turn the page, you can actually see these are all, uh, not actually not all, but most of the available medications we have right now. Um, one thing I'd like to point out on the top there, actually, is estrogen. So there are a lot of ladies in the audience, potentially, who are on estrogen and have been on estrogen since undergoing menopause. Believe it or not, that is actually considered a form of treatment for osteoporosis. Now, estrogen replacement in and of itself is a whole other bag of worms um, in terms of whether you should or whether you shouldn't, whether it's recommended or whether it's not recommended that we're, I'd rather not sort of get into today. But it, so let's suffice it to say if you're already on estrogen, it's probably having some protective effects on your bones. Um, I'd like to um, skip this one for a moment and this one for a moment and just kind of look at these few in the middle. These are some of the bisphosphonates and they all essentially work the same way. The different drug companies have their different you know, brand names and some of these are infusions, IV, and some of them are pills, um, but they essentially all work um, very much the same way. Um, now, I have a little bit more to show you about bisphosphonates, um, but also to let you know, in men, we do have some similar treatments, but we don't have all of the options that the ladies have. Um, but we do have a number of them, um, and so there are many options if any gentlemen out there have been diagnosed with osteoporosis. Now, these are the bisphosphonates. This is the Actinel, the Fosamax, the Reclast. Um, and we use them, essentially, all I wanted to show you on this slide was that we use them because they work. If you aren't taking anything, your bones, your bone density and your bone strength will decrease with time. This is just over three years and the blue category are the people who weren't taking anything. The other ones are people who were on bisphosphonates. The different lines just mean different doses um, of, a, of the same medication. This one happens to be alendronate. Um, but you can see significant improvement in bone density in both the lumbar spine and in the femoral neck, meaning in the hip. <clears throat> now, I, I spent a little time showing you at the beginning that bone density is directly related to risk for fracture. So every time I see increased change in bone density, if it increases, you decrease your risk for fracture. So I just want to keep that in mind that there really is a direct correlation between those two things. <clears throat> now, there are some problems with bisphosphonates that you should be aware of. Not everybody can use them, even though they are sort of our go-to first line choice. Um, if your kidneys aren't working, you should stay away from this particular class of medications. Um, if you have atrial fibrillation, that could potentially make it worse, these bisphosphonates. So you wouldn't necessarily want to be on bisphosphonates if you have atrial fibrillation, which is a fast, funny beat of your heart. Um, if you have acid reflux, esophageal erosions, if you've had ulcers in your stomach or esophagus before, you probably wouldn't want to take this medication. It can be very tough. It can cause ulcers and erosions in and of itself. Anyone in the audience on one of these medications is probably aware that 
Um, it comes with a recommendation to take it with a full glass of water or two and remain upright for at least 30 minutes after taking the pill. We're very serious about that. And that is because if you go back to sleep after taking this pill or you lie down, it could cause an erosion in your esophagus. It could cause bleeding. And that is a very, very big problem. Um, you would want to make sure that your vitamin D levels were good um, either before starting this medication or while you're on this medication for a number of various reasons, but not the least of which is this medication can actually cause a little bit of bone pain if the vitamin D isn't optimized. Um, and if you have a low calcium in your blood, these medications work to, um, in part, what happens as a result of taking these medications is that some of, the blood, some of the calcium moves out of the blood and back into the bones. So if you already have low calcium in your blood, you don't want it getting any lower. So, so certainly you would, your physician would want to review your medical history before starting you on any of these medications, specifically for some of these reasons. <clears throat> now a question I get pretty often is, okay, so I start this, how long do I have to be on it? Well, the answer is typically indefinitely, meaning kind of forever, but I, I do want to give you a word of caution. Um, these medications actually last for a long time in your bones, and so if you need to stop it for any reason, for whatever period of time, um, be it cost or other health reasons, you can stop this medication and it will probably be at work in your system for years, literally years. So taking the medication now um, potentially convert, um, confers some protection to your bones for a very, very long time. So it's not, um, it's not a real problem if you need to stop it for any reason. Um, the other thing that I would mention, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, in the upcoming slides here, um, is that if you've been on a bisphosphonate, meaning Fosamax, Actinel, Reclass, those kind of things, for more than five years, bless you, um, there is a possibility that you would be at risk more risk for fractures. That doesn't sound so great, huh? You're taking a medication to decrease your risk for fractures and you actually have an increased risk for fractures? How does that happen? Well, I would like to just go into that a little bit more. Um, potentially, and the verdict is still out on this a little bit, but I, I think in general, we're, we're, the medical community as a whole is coming to recognize this as an honest truth. Um, that being on bisphosphonates for a very long time can indeed predispose you to a different type of fracture than you would have, than you would be at risk for with simply having osteoporosis. Now, the way that I always sort of like to describe this is um, bisphosphonates, if you're on them for a very long time, they essentially put your bones to sleep. So you have two forces at work in your bones. Um, you have the bone builders and you have the bone eaters. And I kind of touched on this at the beginning of the talk, but um, bisphosphonates make the bone eaters be quiet. It stops the bone eaters from doing their job. So the only problem is, is that the bone builders, the only way that they know to be active and to build bone is if they have a signal from the bone eaters that they've eaten some bone. So what happens is you essentially put the bone builders to sleep as well. So now you're not making any new bone either. Um, one of the most common causes that we lose bone as we get older is because the bone eaters are too active. And so it's a good idea. It's a, it's a good idea to make the bone eaters stop being so active. Unfortunately, over a long period of time, we could adversely affect the bone building forces as well. Now, um, I, I actually can um, do some labs um, that are relatively new, um, but I can see whether your bone builders and your bone eaters are awake or asleep. And actually, if your bone eaters and bone builders are completely asleep after being on bisphosphonates for five years or more, I would say, let's stop it for a year. It's not going to put you at any increased risk for fractures. 
as I mentioned, they stay in your system for a very long time. But it will allow the eaters and the builders to wake up a little bit. And that's a good thing. And that'll protect you from these other types of fractures called atypical fractures. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, there's another very rare condition um, called osteonecrosis of the jaw that can happen with bisphosphonates. Um, typically, it's not seen in the doses that are used as treatment for sort of garden variety osteoporosis. Um, os um, bisphosphonates are used in cancer treatments at much higher doses, and those are the patients that unfortunately are at a little bit higher risk for this particular um, complication. Unfortunately, people do still break bones when they're on bisphosphonates. So what do we do? Well, we actually do have some other medications that we would use. The next thing that your physician would likely move up to, hmm, this isn't working anymore. Um, oh, there we go, okay. Um, the next medication that your physician would probably recommend would be Forteo. Now this actually stimulates the bone builders. So it's fundamentally different medication. It's the only one of its class. Um, this is a daily injection. You only take it for two years, but after two years, the bone builders sort of figure out that you're tricking them. <laughs> so it doesn't work anymore. It's not that it's harmful after two years, it's just that it's not effective. So, you want, so after that, you have to go back on the bisphosphonate for a little while. But you've bumped up your bone density significantly after using it. Um, you would not want to use this medication if your kidneys don't work at all, if you have gout, or if you have a history of osteosarcoma. The newest kid on the block in terms of treatment for, hmm, uh, in terms of treatment for osteoporosis is something called prolia or denosumab. It's a biologic. Um, there's a very specific um, group of people that I would consider using this in. Um, and actually, it really uh, filled a need in the osteoporosis treatment world because people with renal failure can actually use this medication. So that is a, that's very good. Unfortunately, um, it has some of the same problems as the bisphosphonates. It works primarily on the bone eaters. So I'm, a, uh, you know, I'm anticipating that we're going to see a lot of the same, con the same um, concerns with atypical fractures with this very new medication as we are with the bisphosphonates. Um, I'd like to just point out that I did um, take some of the slides and some of the graphics um, from the National Osteoporosis Foundation as well as National Institutes of Health. They have a website about osteoporosis. Um, another um, another uh, place certainly to get information um, is UpToDate or WebMD. They're all very reliable resources and will probably tell you a lot of the same things that you've heard in my talk. So, um, in case you lose this, these papers, or if you just want to learn more, those are all excellent resources and places that you can go. Um, thank you very much. Um, if you think that maybe you want to talk a little bit more about your bones, I'd be certainly happy to talk to you about that. Um, additionally, I am an endocrinologist, and so I also treat uh, thyroid and diabetes and adrenal conditions and bones and calcium problems and all other kinds of things. So I'd be happy to see you if you would like to discuss any of those at any time. Um, I have a few other um, slides, particularly regarding osteoporosis in men um, at the end of the talk here. Um, the take home point from those last few slides is just that it's, it, treatment is very similar um, to treatment for women. Similar medications, similar um, preventive measures, uh, similar calcium and vitamin D recommendations. So, um, so I'm happy to entertain any questions at this point. Um, so the question was, and you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the question was, is there any relationship between eating meat and having calcium deficiencies, low calcium. Um, I don't think, um, my, my, I have not run across anything specific about that. Um, however, I would um, make a connection potentially. Um, if you're on something like the Atkins diet um, or you're eating, um, you're eating a lot of meat and you're not eating a lot of um, 
a uh, lot of dairy products because they have some sugar in them, or if you're not eating a lot of the other things that have calcium in them, potentially, simply just from the shift of dietary pattern, potentially the calcium would go down. Um, additionally, um, if you eat a lot of protein, um, your kidneys handle the processing of the food a little differently, and so I could imagine that there would be an interaction at the level of the kidney and potentially you could cause more calcium to go out in the urine simply because the kidneys have to handle this high protein load. I, I hope that answered your question. Um, is that, there were a few other questions. Um, yes, I think I saw the, the gentleman in the light blue shirt over there. I saw that. Now that's a very good question. It's a very good question. So the question was about the analogy that I made between with the with the rebar and the chicken wire and the cement and you know putting them together. And yes, you're absolutely right. Most of this talk was focused on the cement portion of it. That's what um, is made out of calcium, and that's what becomes weak. Um, the rebar is collagen, and there are many different types of collagen in our bodies. Um, there are some medical conditions, actually, in which the specific type of collagen that's used in bones um, is weaker, kind of, um, kind of a mutated form of that collagen. But, you know, um, the collagen in and of itself doesn't usually change very much. Um, it, again, it, it, it plays into the um, quality of bone. Um, the DEXAs are looking at the quantity of bone and the calcium phosphate, the cement, um, but we don't have any really good tests to see about the collagen, um, the collagen and whether it's getting weaker. And you've actually hit the nail on the head. I think most physicians feel that when we, we are talking about the quality of bone, we are actually talking more about the chicken wire rebar part of the equation than the cement part of the equation. But unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of ways to evaluate that at this point, short of a bone biopsy. So there is some indication that potentially, yes, um, there could be some decrease in the strength of the rebar over time. Um, but at this point, we don't have any really good ways to measure that. So um, yes, um, in, in the front here. That's a very good, very good question. Um, the question was about exercising um, and assuming that, most, that the exercise that most people would do to try and either prevent or help their bones would be walking. Um, and the question was, does it matter if you walk on cement or the grass or a treadmill? And I think that the answer is probably not. It probably does not make a difference. Um, some people find that walking on cement and pavement is tough on their joints and their arthritis for other reasons. And so, you know, if you walk on, if you're walking on, if you're lucky enough to be at the beach and you're walking on sand, or if you're walking in grass or you're walking on a treadmill, um, it should still have the same good effects um, as uh, walking on on pavement. It's not um, the thought at this point is that the walking and the weight bearing is not the actual kind of like thud, thud, stomp, stomp. Um, it actually has more to do with um, changing some other hormones that the, that the bone makes. It's, it, it probably doesn't have to do with the mechanical part of it as much, oddly enough. And that, that data um, came out just within the past year or so, that it's probably not really the actual mechanical forces, but some changes in some other things that make weight-bearing exercise important. Thank you. Of course, of course. Um, yes, um, I'm here in the red shirt. Very good question, very good question. Um, there are a couple of different um, answers to that. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, um, carbonated beverages. I mentioned earlier in the talk that potentially they could cause some weakening of the bones. Um, and, and your question was as to, is it the caffeine? In the, car, in the carbonated beverages, or is it the actual carbonated beverages? Um, you're absolutely right. Caffeine in mega high doses will um, decrease the bones. You kind of need to be a 20 cup a day coffee drinker really to have that be an issue, but it certainly can make the bones a little weaker. Um, actually, it's um, usually most carbonated be uh, beverages have a lot of phosphorus. 
and phosphorus and calcium in the blood are sort of in balance. And if you throw that balance out of whack, then the calcium balance is going to get out of whack. Um, and, um, and that's usually, that's what we think the problem is with carbonated beverages. Um, and I, so I think that maybe some of the clear carbonated beverages don't have quite as much phosphorus in them. Um, but, um, but we think that that's, that's probably the reason for the carbonated beverages being detrimental um, to bone, bone strength. Um, um, yes, sir? Be awful good for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, what, um, one month coffee is good for you, the next month coffee is bad for you. Yeah, the question was about coffee. Um, coffee has, um, it looks like it has a lot of antioxidants and other really good sort of phytonutrients that are good for you. There's some evidence that it decreases your risk of colon cancer and a few other things. Um, I don't have a problem with coffee. Uh, I, I'm quite an avid coffee drinker myself. Um, but um, the caffeine in coffee, it, it, well, coffee is where most people get their caffeine from. And, and that's not necessarily true across the board, um, but caffeine in very, very high doses, which may equate to a lot of cups of coffee, may not be very good for your bones. So, um, uh, yes, sir, in the black jacket? Very good question. So the question was about celiac disease. I think I put that on one of the, um, one of the slides here. Celiac disease, yes, absolutely can affect your bones. Um, if you have celiac disease, what, the question was, what can you do? to get more calcium and vitamin D into your system? Um, that's a difficult question, um, but um, most people with, that I know with celiac disease um, that go on to develop osteoporosis or osteopenia have not really paid a whole lot of attention to trying to get um, calcium and vitamin D into their diet. Um, certainly most people um, with celiac disease um, can take calcium and vitamin D supplements, although you kind of have to play around and see which one um, works with your digestive system. But usually we would recommend that most people with celiac disease start on calcium and vitamin D supplements early in life to try and help prevent this, you know, maybe uh, more so than then um, you know, we may not tell the average 30-year-old to really make sure they're on calcium and vitamin D supplements, but we might tell the average 30-year-old with celiac disease that they should really be on calcium and vitamin D supplements. Um, yes, uh, in the, uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, ma yes, ma'am. Um, the question was about how do you optimize vitamin D? Vitamin D is a very hot topic right now. Um, this particular woman's question was in regard to leg pain. Um, Vitamin D is very interesting. Um, it is, for all intents and purposes, actually been sort of misnamed. It's not really a vitamin, it's actually a hormone. So that's why it falls under the category of endocrinology. By saying that it's a hormone, it means vitamin D actually goes into um, your cells, into the nucleus, and, and exerts some effects by changing um, products made by the cells at a, very, at a cellular molecular level. Um, vitamin D deficiency is rampant in our, in our country. Um, you can check a vitamin D level. Any physician would um, be happy to check it for you. The form that we normally check is called the vitamin D 25 hydroxy. Um, and that's just the standard one that we check. If you're found to be low, we would generally recommend that you go on supplements. And usually the way that we do it is we kind of um, fill up the gas tank with high dose vitamin D for a little while. Um, a, you know, a very strong pill once a week for four to eight weeks, depending on how low your vitamin D is. And then we recommend that you go on maintenance after that to try and keep it at the level where it is. We want your vitamin D to be above 30. If your vitamin D level is not above 30, then a whole nother set of hormones gets kicked off in your body, particularly parathyroid hormone. And what happens when parathyroid hormone goes up in your body, it starts to take the calcium out of your bones to put it into your blood. Um, and so that's how your bones could potentially get weaker if you have low vitamin D. Um, but the other very interesting thing about vitamin, vitamin D is that we're finding it seems to be related to a whole myriad of things, including um, 
generalized aches and bone pains and mood and sleeping disorders. Now, um, I routinely replete a lot of vitamin D on, on people that come to see me. And I'd say about a third of the patients probably come back and tell me, um, gosh, doc, that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I don't hurt anymore. I feel great. Um, of course, there's another two thirds of patients that don't notice any difference. Um, but um, vitamin D um, isn't going to hurt you if it's optimized and very few people have actual sort of side effects from it. It's not going to cause any nausea or vomiting or headaches or dizziness or anything like that. So you kind of can't go wrong trying to optimize your vitamin D. Um, so um, I'm, I'm um, yes ma'am? Yes, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, the question was um, in terms of supplements um, for all kinds of things, but I, I imagine you mean specifically calcium and vitamin D and supplements to help your bones and whatnot. Um, calcium is calcium and vitamin D is vitamin D. So anyone who is trying to sell you this, this is much, much better, um, I, would, I, I haven't seen any particular data saying that one supplement is much better than another. You may just be lightening your pocketbook. Um, and, and uh, you know, if it, with, that, with that being said, you know, maybe I'm just not aware. It's, you know, there are a lot of supplements out there. I can't possibly keep up with every single supplement that's available. Um, and so, perhaps, you know, it's possible that there is one that's better than another, but, but most of the ones that I've seen that purport to say they're much better than X, Y, or Z really, really aren't. They're just more expensive. So, um, yes, um, ma'am. Sure, sure. And you know, um, and actually, you you are you you are following on the heels of what, no pun intended, what some other people thought. Um, th I'm sorry. This question, in case nobody heard it, was: um, um, Is there sort of a pre-screening to the screening DEXA that maybe you could do? Um, and there are a number of ways to measure bone density. I, I, I think maybe I alluded to it in one of the slides here, but there are a number of ways that you can do, that you can get a bone density. Um, and in fact, in sort of underserved areas um, where there aren't a whole lot of doctors, there aren't a whole lot of hospitals, um, some of the primary care physicians actually do have these kind of portable um, bone density things where you can stick your foot in and it'll, it'll sort of give you one of those readings, like are you at risk or are you not, and should you be sent for a DEXA or should you not. Um, and they certainly have been validated in clinical trials. They are, um, they are not bad screening tests, um, particularly in the underserved areas. Um, but um, here um, in the Tri-Cities, we certainly have um, enough um, availability of DEXA that um, it really is the gold standard. Um, Bo DEXA scans are actually recommended over CT scans or any other kind of modality to, um, to test bone density. Um, and so sort of a, if you consider DEXA to be the, the screening test for osteoporosis, then sort of doing a pre-screening for the screening test may not be the most efficient use of your time or money um, but certainly, but certainly, if you know someone who's had had these kind of things done, they're they're not inappropriate, and they certainly have been shown to be effective and useful in clinical trials. There are a number of other ways to that you can measure bone density. Is it vascular free now? The first of every month, and it's only thirty dollars for the test. And this bone screen is only thirty dollars if you can find where they're doing it versus how much for DEXA. Very true. Very true. It's a very good point, and if you um, find something like that, it's absolutely worth worth going to. Um, and and I would advocate that kind of a screening test, sort of a pre-screening for a screen test. If you if you don't have any of these risk factors, right? If you don't have any family history of you know broken bones, if you don't have any history of cancer or um, conditions that have been treated with steroids or anything like that. If you, if you go through this and you don't, you don't really check off any of those things and say that doesn't apply to me, um, then certainly um, one of these kind of cheaper stick your foot in it, see if you have bone density, would probably, that would probably be the person that I would recommend that kind of a screening for. Someone who is at super low risk based on their sort of risk factor profile. So, um, 
Well, thank you all very much. I can stick around up here um, for a little bit longer if there are any, you know, questions that you want to ask me later. So thank you.